try without a microphone um, because then I can walk around a bit more. Okay, can you hear me in the back? Okay, great. Um, um, yeah, I was a little scared to accept this uh, invitation, uh, in particular since I have to really lecture again tomorrow, so I figured that something would happen to me tonight uh, uh, if it is, you know, if it is to be more real uh, last lecture. But uh, yeah, I didn't take it uh, that, uh, that literal. Uh, it's a nice idea, and I thought I'll take a, uh, an issue that, um, that, that I find important to, to bring across uh, with students. Uh, to uh, learn to ask questions. You were uh, very nicely, uh, thanks for the introduction, and you pointed out that children harass their parents with this question. Uh, it strikes me, and as I put this up here, that, that uh, students, when they do their thesis uh, here at, at the college, or also when they uh, write papers, uh, they have often difficulty uh, coming up with a good uh, research question. Uh, by sort of, they, they, they just start somewhere sometimes, and they just end somewhere, and uh, I thought, okay, if I give you a last message, uh, a good way to structure is, is by asking questions. And the most simple one is, of course, why? I have a few more there. Uh, uh, first, of what question? What is? What is this? Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, how come? Uh, why do we have it? Um, uh, when uh, did it happen? Uh, under which conditions? Uh, and how come? Uh, and uh, also, kind of, in particular, this kind of sense of surprise, how the hell is this possible? How can we explain it? Uh, and I think if all, all your research uh, is, is really driven by, by that question, uh, it, 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 it's much more fun to do, I think, on the one hand, uh, and, and it's, uh, it leads also to more resource, uh, results. Uh, the best thesis that I had in this uh, last years were indeed thesis that had a very clear, interesting question. I remember a thesis that was why is there no IKEA in South America, in Latin America? Uh, a surprising question. Uh, uh, nobody, you wouldn't come so easily think about that. Uh, or uh, another one, uh, a thesis that was a study of the um, um, uh, United Nations forces in Kosovo. The question, why do the locals hate the, uh, the military from uh, the UN, which are there to protect themselves? It's also something that you would not sort of, you know, understand uh, at first instance. And uh, um, that's why I want to pay some attention uh, to this question. Uh, uh, why very often sort of the answer gets given very quickly. Uh, often, that's why. This is the answer. Uh, you better believe it. I guess that's what your mom and dad do if you ask a, a lot of uh, nasty questions. Is, that's the way we do it. That's how it ought to be done. Uh, uh, and you better uh, take it. You better believe it. You better accept my authority. Uh, uh, and. Um, that's exactly what I think uh, should not happen because you get, keep asking the question, but why? Why? What is the answer? You give an answer to the question, uh, but why is that a good answer? So keep asking uh, questions and to keep questioning. Uh, don't accept the easy answers. Uh, and and so very, very often, you, we, we are talking about a long um, um, chain of uh, causality. Uh, and, uh, so be, uh, get also the easy answers and, and keep, uh, uh, keep asking. <coughs> um, um, okay, I will ask a few questions uh, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll discuss some of them. Um, you get, of course, uh, make the distinction. Uh, uh, we have a saying uh, in Dutch, Dwaas van je vraag en als honderd wijzen kunnen antwoorden. So one fool can ask more questions than hundred sages can answer. Um, but um, the, the, other, uh, the other approach is what I learned uh, when I was in the United States, uh, uh, that a student never has a stupid question. Uh, there is only a stupid uh, answer of the teacher, but a student should be uh, completely free to ask anything uh, outrageous. And uh, sometimes uh, questions that at, at first look very stupid uh, may not be so uh, uh, in the end. Um, so, um, yeah, my central message actually with this is um, remain curious, ask questions, uh, wonder why things are the way they are, uh, uh, and be open to surprise. And I notice that it's actually getting more and more difficult for us to be surprised because um, so many things have become self-evident. Uh, 
Uh, we have all this new technology. Imagine uh, that somebody from 200 years ago, living 200 years ago, would sort of, uh, suddenly uh, appear uh, at this in the 21st century. And he would see these, uh, you know, 100 ton uh, airplanes uh, uh, hanging there in the air. How come? Huh? How come? How that's, that's why we're so used to it. We trust it also. We enter these airplanes. Uh, uh, we have full trust that they, that they won't uh, fall down. Uh, it's become self-evident also that you pick up your mobile phone that you might have here uh, and, and uh, you can do almost anything with it by now. Uh, you can uh, connect uh, to uh, uh, somebody on the other, other side of the planet, uh, whereas not so long ago, I think even less than 100 years ago, uh, it would take uh, uh, several months uh, uh, to, uh, to go there. Uh, uh, for example, if you would go to Indonesia, the Dutch had their empire overseas, uh, and in, in the days of the Dutch East India Republic, uh, it took, uh, uh, took a ship several months actually to get there to deliver uh, a command of, uh, um, <coughs> of the uh, Helen uh, Satan King, uh, the, the boarding of uh, um, the, the board. And it would take um, uh, also uh, another three or four months to get the message back, uh, and very often also the ship uh, went down the drain. So uh, I, I've seen in the archives that uh, uh, the governor general often, uh, when they send a letter back, they send it in three different copies, and they made three copies, and they send it by three different uh, uh, ships uh, back to uh, to Holland, just to be sure that if two ships would uh, save that, the message would still run. Uh, and uh, I mean, look where we are right now. Uh, uh, we fly, we phone, we have standard immediate access to information uh, uh, that I can still even uh, myself uh, remember the days that uh, when we did research, we actually physically had to go to all kinds of libraries and archives, uh, and I see that the students don't uh, nowadays hardly have to do that anymore. So um, many wonders, uh, the Dutch word wonder, uh, uh, miracle, uh, have become uh, self-evident, and I think it is a challenge also to to see the, the miracle in it, to be, sort of, to keep wondering, as I say, huh? how come, how, how is this possible? Uh, and be, in, in that connection, it may also be a link to uh, wandering in the other sense that you move around, move around the world, move in different worlds, different disciplines, uh, 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 move in different uh, archives, uh, and look what is beyond the horizon, huh? not only sort of look with your mobile phone, but actually sort of physically uh, going out there. That is my, the central message that I, I would like to uh, uh, leave behind, and I'll, uh, I'll um, uh, elaborate that. And I think also I'm fascinated myself by paradoxes, by two things that cannot be uh, 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 true at the same time. Uh, and, and the world is also full of uh, such paradoxes, and uh, I find that even, even more um, fascinating. Um, let me give you a few, uh, uh, I'll skip this one, give you a few riddles. Uh, um, one that, that fascinates me a lot, but it's not my field of study, is uh, how can I think with my brain? Uh, uh, and how can I actually pronounce all these words that, that I, I do right now? It's again something self-evident we don't think about that. Um, uh, um, and uh, um, yeah, that was a riddle in the past too for people. How come? How come? How is it possible for uh, us to, uh, uh, to think? And the old solution was uh, to think out that there is a little man in your hand, head there, uh, which he calls the homunculus, uh, and that's the little uh, uh, man that did the thinking uh, for us in our head. But of course, uh, uh, that's not an answer to the problem, uh, because then the question becomes, how does this little man in our head uh, do, uh, do the thinking? So you basically repeat the problem, you don't uh, uh, answer uh, the question. Uh, it still remains, I think. Nowadays we know we have sort of weak electric currents in our brain, and several of you are probably uh, and know more about this than I do. I'm really a, a, a layman here, but I'm fascinated by this uh, uh, question, and I even think that if I would start studying again, I'd probably do uh, a, a, a neurology, a brain neurology. I find it so fascinating. Um, I, said I would like to understand it. Um, 
But uh, so the question is, how can the, even the brain think about the brain? <coughs> this, the, the supreme sort of self-consciousness. Um, yeah, is it, for, for example, necessary uh, to use language? Uh, uh, can we think without language? And that's another, okay, we might get the linguists and the philosophers in as well. Again, this one's that I don't know so much about. Um, but uh, that's, how, can, you, can we try to imagine that we could think about build a reasoning without having access to language? Uh, uh, there probably is an answer to that, uh, at least preliminary answers uh, to that. Um, but I have to admit here, um, it's not my field, I don't know the answer. But I'm curious. Uh, uh, and uh, that's, as I said, I would, that is what I would like to study. Let me give you a few other riddles. Uh, one is uh, the classic one that I use once in a while. I'm fascinated by it too. Uh, and actually today was a week again in the newspaper uh, that Hennigan, uh, uh, the brewer of beer, uh, um, had again a growth in turnover and uh, um, profits increased. And that was brought as uh, um, good news. Yeah, it's good news for the employer for the employees, for the shareholders, for everybody who has a stake uh, in the company. Um, at the same time, we read uh, all the time that our government has such a problem uh, with, with reaching an agreement of the different parties that uh, negotiate. And one of the issues is the rising cost of health care. Uh, uh, for apparently, that's a problem. And, but if you think about it, you know, we consume beer and we consume health care. And there's both a cost side to it. We have to pay for the beer. We have to pay for the health care. Um, uh, and there is a, the other side. Uh, there is employment uh, for the, uh, the workers. There is uh, income for the shareholders. And that holds for beer production. But that, of course, holds also for all the doctors and nurses uh, that work in uh, uh, the health care sector. Uh, uh, why could we not, for example, if we had, the paradox is all the more interesting because we think beer is unhealthy and healthcare should at least make you a little bit better. Um, um, uh, what, so why don't we turn it around? Huh? Uh, why is not sort of uh, fantastic uh, results uh, of uh, turnover and profit of healthcare? And actually, uh, yesterday I think it was that the uh, Philips, which uh, is increasingly sort of investing in. Uh, 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 equipment for healthcare uh, is doing very well, and I see Robin back there, right? <laughs> oh wow, Robin is one of our graduates. She knew all about uh, the uh, uh, homunculus problem. Uh, we, we did that uh, together in a paper. And Robin works now for Philips in the medical uh, uh, sector, so she she has a job actually indirectly uh, from this uh, healthcare. And that, uh, that costs us uh, so much. Um, so, yeah, um, what's it, can, can, why, why do we complain about healthcare and why are we happy about beer? Who dares? An answer, any, any idea? Yep? You could argue that healthcare is a need that everybody has, whereas beer is not something that You could say that everybody needs healthcare, but not everybody needs beer. Uh, yeah, so we should be all the more happy then that there is good health care because everybody needs it. Yeah. yeah, so we could do without beer. So we should, uh, we should not care so much for it. We shouldn't feel that happy when, uh, when beer consumption has grown. I, I only emphasize uh, my point. Yeah. Isn't it just that today's good news, um, higher turnover is generally regarded as very good news. Yeah. Higher turnover means more income, so indirectly good things. Yeah. Whereas an increased healthcare cost means that everyone has to pay more for their healthcare and paying more is considered as a bad thing. But well, we have to pay for the beer too. Yes, but the we beer is not free. getting more expensive. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, but, but the benefit is, of course, that uh, with beer, uh, you might live less long, and uh, if you get good health care, uh, you, you guys might even get 100. Uh, life expectancy is increasing every year. So, uh, it might be that it gets more expensive, but at the same time, uh, we have more benefits of it. And what's wrong with having an economy in the future? Uh, we had an economy not so long ago where 80% where 
of the employees who are working in a factory or, or in a coal mine. Uh, and now we have uh, less than 10% of the Dutch that actually uh, work in industry and of which only perhaps 5% uh, work actually in a factory. The rest works in the administration uh, and the, the sales and, uh, in, 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 and buying and advertising, of course. Uh -uh. So that has shifted. Why could we not imagine an economy in the future where 80% of us work in healthcare? Sorry? <laughs> yeah, you would be hungry. Ha <laughs> ha. Yep. Why? Because you can't have beer. Oh, well, but our food, food is nowadays made by machines, uh, and, and, and it, anyway, uh, we import it. Uh, most of the food that we eat comes from abroad anyway. Beer is, beer yeah. is something that we want to be spending money on. Sorry? Beer is something that we want to be spending money on. You don't like wake up one day and think, like, I'm just going to buy some aspirin because I feel like it. It's just, wait, so you don't want to spend on... No, on but basically, uh, the reason we don't like paying for healthcare is because um, we, like beer is something, um, like how do I say it, like, if you're, if you're going to be paying for healthcare, it's because there's something going wrong with you at that, yeah, at that yeah. moment. But so, then you want to get better. Right, but you're not happy to be paying for it. <laughs> like, it's not a luxury, it's something that you kind of have to undergo, whereas beer is something that, if you want to have beer, it's because it's just... Well, you don't like, have to undergo it, you can, you, you can just uh, get further and ever more sick than, uh, than die. I mean, I, th I think it's way more important, actually, to get that healthcare than, yeah? When I pay for beer, I get beer, and I'm happy with the of beer. But when I pay for healthcare, I don't actually get it unless I get sick. So I'm paying for it all the time, but not necessarily actually enjoy it. Okay, here you come close to the answer that is, I think. Uh, with beer, we have the profit principle. Uh, you, you pay and you get something immediately in return. There is an immediate exchange. So uh, we make an offer, but we get at the same time the benefit. Uh, and with healthcare, it's usually we pay for the insurance, and particularly when you're young. Uh, you don't need so much health care yet, uh, uh, so you uh, pay a long time. And, uh, uh, our, the estimation actually is that half of your health care costs uh, are uh, spent in your last, last year of your life. Uh, uh, so uh, there is a big distance between paying and receiving the benefit. Uh, and I think that is uh, uh, at least one of the explanations uh, uh, of, of this uh, uh, curi uh, curious phenomenon. Um, uh, um, but so that is an answer, I would say. The question one is why is uh, why is sale of beer more positive? The answer, one answer, could be the profit principle, profit potential. Um, but uh, uh, why then? Then it's another question. Why do we pay collectively? Uh, uh, why do we make that a tax? Uh, and okay, there's an element of solidarity there. Uh, uh, it would also be possible, I think, to have different arrangements that each one sort of saves uh, personally. Uh, uh, as, we, as, as in some countries you do for your pension. Um, but okay, they have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and uh, the fact is, indeed, uh, um, we pay up front and we don't immediately get, see the, sort of the, what we get in return. But it remains a bit of a riddle, I think. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, okay, uh, that's a second riddle. Um, yeah, a very classical one is, but it's still a, a, an interesting riddle is why are some countries rich and other countries poor? Uh, and much of economic historians uh, have written uh, thick books about that, and there is still no satisfied, uh, universally agreed answer uh, to this uh, question. Uh, in the past, uh, people have said, well, it is in the, sort of in the rich countries, people work harder, there's a work ethic, um, but um, yeah, that doesn't really hold, because there are countries uh, that are, uh, 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 um, don't have a Protestant ethic, don't have even a Protestant religion, uh, but nevertheless uh, 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 do very well uh, and, and are getting uh, richer and richer. So um, that kind of, uh, we discard that uh, explanation here again, question, answer, question, answer. And I mean to say, by keeping questioning, trying to get uh, further uh, uh, and closer to an answer to the problem. Uh, another one has uh, another proposal um, that has been made, among others, by economists in, uh, in Holland about 10, 15 years ago. Wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, yeah, that's the climate and the weather. Because it's a curious phenomenon, actually, that most of the poor countries are in warm uh, parts of the world, uh, and uh, um, the rich countries, uh, more prosperous countries, are in the sort of the northern and uh, the southern part. Even in South America, you see that uh, Chile and Argentina are doing better uh, uh, than uh, the countries further up north, like uh, Colombia and so on. Uh, so in Dutch, you could say, warm is harm. Huh? Um, and there have been explanations for that. Cultural explanations here is what culture used to come in economics. Uh, that people said, well, in a warm country, um, you have not developed a culture of um, saving for the future. Uh, you don't have a cold winter. Uh, and just like, like animals in, in, in uh, cold parts of the world, uh, uh, in the fall, they make a storage of uh, uh, nut, uh, nuts uh, so to survive uh, over the um, uh, to survive over the winter. Uh, and uh, the argument here is that in cold countries, uh, uh, people have used, gotten used to the idea to uh, uh, to uh, uh, invest and to save uh, in order to uh, to go come through the winter. And that apparently, but don't ask me how because it's another uh, big why question. Uh, even if that would be true in primordial times, why would it still be valid uh, uh, now? Uh, and, uh, um, and of course, you have also some very rich countries right on the equator. Uh, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, I heard it probably more, but uh, I was in both of them, and it's amazing to see. Uh, uh, I've lived myself in, in Cernam, as I will tell you in a minute, um, and I'm a bit used to sort of developing countries that are living around the equator. Uh, but Singapore is like New York. Uh, uh, it's like New York on the equator. So yeah, that also doesn't explain it. Um, then other people have come up with the explanation of good institutions. Uh, uh, respect for the rule of law, uh, solid regulation, and indeed Singapore is known for uh, very strict uh, uh, policing. Uh, you can even get a 20 uh, uh, euro ticket for uh, dropping some bubble gum on the floor. Uh, um, and. Uh, uh, that would at least explain uh, the exception of Singapore and Malaysia. But that, of course, is again the question, how come you got uh, respect for the rule of law? How would that have come from? So I, I mean to say we start with a riddle, and then we can keep asking questions, come up with uh, hypotheses, and try to find answers to some questions, and then go on um, to the next one. Um, last one that I also find quite fascinating is um, what motivates a suicide bomb? How we see ever more suicide bombings, and the question is, how come? Uh, why do these people do that? Uh, I mean, this is sort of the, the, the biggest offer that you can make. Uh, you kill yourself in, in sort of the, um, because of a certain ID uh, that you have in your uh, mind. So the first answer to what motivates a suicide bomber is, will be, is Muslim belief. Uh, but then, why is he a Muslim? Uh, uh, and then it could be answered, yeah, you, you know, you become a Muslim if you're born in a Muslim territory. Uh, and uh, uh, it were, were, so there's kind of uh, pressure to do that. Now, I was born in a Christian territory, um, so why am I not a Christian? Uh, uh, actually, I used to be. I was raised like one, uh, but I'm not anymore. Um, so, um, yeah, you could say in a close society, if you grow up in a Muslim world, hey, you're under social pressure, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, yeah, uh, there are less alternatives. You, you cannot do anything else. Uh, people uh, really frown upon you. They might even, as we see, uh, harass you, uh, punish you uh, if you don't uh, abide by uh, 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 these norms and values. And it's not that long ago, actually, that we had that also with uh, uh, Christian, uh, Orthodox Christians in, uh, in Holland um, who would also sanction uh, uh, the people in their village, for example, if they, washed, uh, if they would wash the car uh, on Sunday, uh -huh. then they would also get uh, So yeah, um, this, the, here we come to a topic which is central in social science, namely the social construction of reality and of identity. Yeah, and uh, um, much of what we do is actually uh, uh, okay, we get used to it uh, in socialization, and it's a reaction to um, to how other people uh, sort of uh, perceive us, what they expect from us. Uh, there's a set of mutual expectations uh, between people, 
and uh, people really uh, adhere uh, uh, to this. Uh, um, and I have a, uh, I had a funny experience that uh, about 15 years ago, I was uh, for three uh, three days the president of France. Uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, it's a really curious phenomenon. What happened is that the European Union uh, and uh, uh, Holland was then uh, sort of chairing the European Union, and uh, um, they organized, as you know, the chairmanship shifts every every six months, uh, and that particular part of the year, uh, Holland did that, and they organized a number of uh, conferences. And uh, I was speaker at one of the conferences on uh, on uh, working conditions uh, in factories. Uh, and people so from all of the, the Europe were there. Uh, it was Amsterdam at the beginning in January. And then I, f I came there and I found out um, that they wanted to use this uh, uh, um, um, meeting to try out uh, the security for, um, the, you know, at the end of the half year, there is a, the, Council of, uh, uh, the Council of Heads of State comes together. And in that case, uh, also in, ju in June, that would have been the case. Uh, that was the case then, uh, and that led eventually also to what we call the Treaty of Amsterdam, which was an amendment of the Treaty of Rome. Uh, but they used this one conference to, to try, it, try it out. And I got placed in the position of the President of France, which meant I got a five-room suite and the most expensive hotel in, hotel in Amsterdam. And I had uh, two bodyguards, uh, three bodyguards sometimes, uh, with me all the time. And when I was in my room, two of them would stand in front of the door uh, and, and guard that. Uh, when we uh, crossed the street from the hotel to the conference venue, there were policemen on motor a motorcycle stopping the traffic for us to pass through. Um, and in the beginning, it, it looks very funny, but um, I very got quick, I very quickly got, got used to that. I, I was addressed as if I was the president of France, and I gradually noticed, <coughs> only in hindsight, that I started behaving like one. And I started to find it self-evident that I had a bodyguard. And uh, uh, I mean, I'm not easily angry, but uh, I was upset that uh, uh, on the third day that one of the bodyguards was not in front of my door. Uh, what's wrong here? And, <laughs> so apparently, <coughs> if, you, uh, uh, if you get uh, treated uh, as a uh, as um, yeah, a person in a certain position, you start you start fulfilling that role. You start to uh, uh, satisfy it, and I think that's what often happens also with politicians. Uh, you see that um, new 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 people become uh, pretty soon uh, cabinet ministers and uh, prime minister, uh, and some of them may not have that experience. And uh, when they eventually uh, get in that role, uh, immediately that next uh, uh, minute. There is this fancy car for them with a, a, a taxi of a, a chauffeur, uh, uh, and, and uh, um, if they are in a hurry, also they they make the siren go. Uh, uh, you get treated differently, uh, uh, and uh, um, people also uh, new ministers get uh, get trained also. Uh, they actually the top civil servants come by them for the first week to tell them exactly what they can do and what they cannot do. Uh, to speak. Don't, don't forget that sort of the, the civil servants are a bit the conscience of the, uh, the minister. They remind him constantly also what he cannot do, uh -uh, but also what he should do and how he should uh, behave also in practical uh, things. And it's pretty difficult actually for uh, individual ministers uh, to uh, uh, the, um, go away from uh, these expectations. Okay, uh, these are some of the examples of a riddle. Uh, and I would say it's uh, if you do a thesis, uh, it's nice to have such a riddle, something that fascinates you. Like uh, also the mention that I uh, had about uh, IKEA. Um, very often we can also derive riddles in many sciences from theory. Theory predicts this, we find that, how come? Uh, again, curiosity, trying to find out uh, what explains that. Um, Okay, um, yeah, we could say, here we come actually to uh, an, a central element in, uh, uh, in social science, uh, the social construction of reality, uh, that, um, that uh, is a famous uh, uh, theory, theoretical statement, uh, what we call the Thomas Theorem, uh, named after uh, W.I. Thomas, who uh, was a sociologist uh, who wrote in the 1930s in, uh, in the US. 
And uh, he uh, came to the uh, statement, it's a very simple one, if man believes something to be true, it's true in its consequences. Uh, so if people believe in a religion, for example, and if you abide by that religion, uh, that you will uh, go to heaven, uh, and people will behave as if that is true. Uh, and many, many phenomena and many objects also that we have, uniforms, money, uh, uh, is uh, socially defined. Basically money is just a piece of paper, uh, uh, but we have defined it uh, as money, uh, and we have given it a certain value, and we, because we all believe uh, in this, uh, uh, and we are, that's why we are also certain that, that they're willing to take, say, you sell your house for, uh, for uh, um, I don't know, 200,000 uh, uh, euros, uh, and you might get it uh, on a piece of paper or even electronically nowadays. Uh, people still willing to do that um, because we have defined this, either the piece of paper or what the numbers on a computer screen as money, and we know because people trust that, uh, that we can use that money again to buy something else. But as soon as uh, somebody yells, the emperor has no clothes, uh, then we get galloping inflation, nobody wants to accept the euro anymore, uh, and, and uh, they look for something uh, else to, uh, to uh, transmit it. Um, in the social construction of reality, you see also that rumors can play an important role, as you can see here in, in a, a comment uh, from the uh, financial markets. Uh, 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 really excel, excel, sell, 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 and then from sell, 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 uh, uh, I'm too scared, I, I'm run away, goodbye, bye, 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 and then uh, uh, it passes on from one person, and that is how you get an instant uh, on the stock exchange, something instant new as, as social definitions uh, of reality, uh, which have serious consequences with uh, uh, much of the financial, uh, uh, the problems of the financial market that we have are imaginary problems, huh? because just because the sellers expect that something is going to happen uh, with Greece, that Greece may not pay back, huh? uh, they, are, uh, they are wanting, uh, they, they want a higher, uh, um, sort of, uh, a higher interest uh, to compensate for the risk they run, and because they want a higher interest, uh, they actually create the problem uh, that they are fearful of, because, because they, Greece has to pay a higher interest rate it actually adds to the financial problems of, uh, of the country. So the rumor actually is also, uh, the rumors in the financial markets create in, to some extent, the problems that people are uh, afraid of. Uh, yeah. There are, so there, these are just four, four examples of riddles that, uh, uh, that have interested me. Uh, and, uh, um, and there are many of them. And in, in search for an answer to the riddle, uh, you can come to, uh, up to discoveries. Uh, you can uh, discover answers, uh, uh, but uh, in search um, for the riddles, uh, you may also go to uh, new, uh, new parts of the world, uh, 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 travel around, uh, go to, uh, also within Holland, you'd be surprised how many, how many nukes and crannies there are that uh, most people don't have a clue about that they exist. They might actually right next, be next to your door. Uh, yeah. uh, I had the experience also as a social uh, science researcher that actually go out in the field and then you discover uh, worlds there that, uh, um, that you had no clue that, uh, uh, that exist. So it's also a discovery of the world in which you uh, live if you uh, look for uh, answers. Um, yeah, uh, the discoveries, of course, uh, can provide answers, and, and uh, um, they make, uh, that's basically what we do with uh, uh, research. Uh, um, so, um, one role model for a good researcher, for a good academic, I think is uh, um, that uh, often uh, discover. Uh, discover that discovers uh, new worlds. Columbus went to America, discovered a new world. Uh, and uh, um, that's basically also what a researcher uh, does. In particular, I have here uh, the ideal uh, academic researcher and a few sort of role models. Uh, you have uh, the uh, discoverer of Columbus and the, the picture of Columbus setting foot on, uh, uh, on America. Um, that is one of them. Um, another one I would say is the detective. Uh -uh. The detective has a problem that he wants to solve. Uh, there is a the murder uh, has uh, been committed, 
and what the detective does is try to find out who did it. And, and apparently that's such a fascinating uh, uh, procedure that we can write books about it, we read it, uh, we watch it on TV, it keeps us uh, uh, sort of uh, um, fascinated. And uh, basically I think that is what a good researcher should also do. Uh, there is a murder and you are uh, about to solve that murder. That is, that is what your uh, research is about. Of course, a good academic researcher is also uh, somebody who can actually do uh, um, laboratory work, but even in a, also in a laboratory, how you can uh, make uh, these uh, uh, micro discoveries, uh, uh, not only in the social world. Um, a good social scientist uh, would also be a bit of a journalist, I think, inquisitive, go around, ask, talk to people, uh, uh, interview them, uh, make notes. Um, uh, identify, because what a journalist does is also to filter sort of what goes on and, and, and tries to estimate what is, uh, what is useful uh, for people to know. Uh, and what we often don't uh, uh, underrate, we, we talk about social science, but I think social science in a way also an art. Uh, it comes close, some depends a bit which branch you are, economics is closer to uh, science, uh, um, but uh, uh, certain branches in sociology are much closer actually to, to art, the art world, uh, philosophy. Uh, uh, so I have also pictured uh, the artist as a role model. Um, yeah, maybe before I, uh, I wanted to say something about my own social uh, 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 construction of my identity because I understood that's part of this, uh, this, uh, this um, endeavor uh, that you get a little bit personal. Um, do we want a break? Um, because then this would be a good moment. Shall I just continue? Okay. Um, yeah, that's my own social construction of identity. Uh, how did I come here at University College? Uh, uh, and sort of what is my background? What have I gone through? Um, and I, I link that to this, what I was talking about, sort of the, the social world that the, uh, the Muslim find themselves in. Uh, um, my uh, background is a pretty strict Calvinist. My uh, grandfather from my mother's side uh, was a uh, uh, Calvinist preacher. Uh, you see him on the right uh, picture. And, and uh, throughout the house I, were pictures of the man on the left. Uh, that is uh, Calvin Calvin. Um, that was a pretty strict world uh, to grow up in. And uh, um, uh, yeah, I. I I have not really felt it as, as constraining, but in the beginning, because in the you know, early years you don't really notice it uh, so much, but when you grow up and you become a uh, um, um, teenager, uh, then it starts to uh, become a bit more, this is not allowed, that is not allowed, I wasn't allowed to go dancing, I wasn't allowed to go, uh, do sports on Sunday, uh, and uh, these are the, the first things that you run into as a kid. Um, but, um, yeah, um, I got my freedom in a way, by uh, discovery, by leaving. And that was not actually thanks to my own initiative. I was only uh, 13 years old uh, when that happened. But we uh, kind of emigrated uh, to Suriname, to Dutch Guiana. That was sort of my father uh, took that uh, decision. Uh, and uh, we just had to follow. He was the authority. Uh, and uh, um, we just had to uh, follow that. So, um, um, I was already apparently early on very curious. Uh, I have the uh, interesting uh, um, case that my father was a, uh, um, uh, an accountant, an auditor, and he was a very meticulous man, and I was the first child uh, 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 born. Um, so that was apparently quite an event, uh, which meant that my father wrote a diary uh, uh, about everything what I did in the first uh, sort of two and a half years of my life. And my sister got uh, uh, born in the, when I was four. Um, uh, the, new, the newness was gone, so she doesn't have a book like that. But I, uh, I can sort of trace back what I did and what happened to me in a period that you normally don't remember. Interesting <coughs> riddle too, why don't we remember things from before a certain age? Uh, uh, or in some things, apparently we, we uh, unconsciously uh, can't trace back. Uh, but uh, normally we don't know what we did in the first uh, two or three years of our, our life. And, uh, uh, I, uh, you can see a picture uh, of the, the dense text that my father wrote for every day. There is a page like that uh, for three years. Uh, um, and uh, it was very often mentioned that uh, 
I was curious, uh, looking around, climbing everything, and uh, of course, uh, I thought that was very special, but uh, anybody who is uh, a psychologist knows, of course, that young children are, are like that, so uh, perhaps it's not that special. Um, it says also that I love colors, uh, which is why I added some color also to these uh, sheets. Uh, I, do love, I do like colors. Um, um, yeah, and so uh, early on I was quite uh, curious, uh, but it was a bit uh, sort of uh, break through my sort of Calvinist uh, uh, upbringing. And what uh, sort of brought freedom in a way uh, was uh, traveling. So as I said, my father immigrated. And so I spent, uh, spent uh, 10 years in Suriname, here. Uh, these pictures are from uh, Suriname, that's a map of uh, Suriname. Suriname is Deschiana, of course, it used to be Palmy of Palm, because in the, the days that I was there, indeed, uh, um, it was a Palm. Well, it, it's not really Palm anymore, but it was kind of a semi independent part of the kingdom of uh, the Netherlands. So they had their own government. Um, and if you see, you look very close. Um, this is one of the capital car, my world looks like. I can highly, highly recommend it. It's one of, it's a beautiful city. Uh, it is, uh, and it's supposed to be actually one of the most beautiful cities in, uh, in all of South America. So it's very well uh, renovated also. And uh, yeah, then I went on to New York and uh, to uh, Toronto. Uh, this is a picture from the city of Toronto in Canada where I uh, uh, did my undergraduate work so uh, long before Dutch, other Dutch people did liberal arts and science uh, I did that already in the uh, was, uh, between 60 and 72 uh, no it was 68 and 72 um, and uh, that was a much larger university I was at uh, 60,000 uh, uh, students uh, but they were all bro uh, broken up in small colleges uh, a bit lo larger than this one we have about uh, 700 students here uh, there was an average 2,000, but uh, the college that I was was out, also out in the countryside, so it was completely uh, uh, so quite a community uh, uh, life here as well. Um, then I went back to Leiden uh, to say, and uh, thereafter I spent uh, my, much of my working life also in uh, places like uh, I've been two years at Stanford. This is what all the looks like. Which, by the way, I would highly recommend for our youth students. Uh, it's one of, in social science, it's one of the, the best uh, graduate schools. I was there as a uh, senior researcher, um, but it would be an excellent place uh, to write a PhD and to get a good scholarship team, at least if you are from a country that is a country of the European Union. So, yeah, I discovered countries, and in a way, that, that gave me the freedom from uh, sort of the constraints. Uh, uh, from what Dutch society was, at least in the, uh, the 1950s still. Uh, after 68, of course, everything broke loose here too, uh, and things changed, but um, yeah, um, this part of my discovery is countries, uh, other countries. Uh, these are some pictures of the universities uh, that I spent at the University of Toronto, with 60,000 students, the uh, University of Leiden, um, the nice building over there is from Stanford. Uh, that is a really beautiful campus in sort of uh, 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 Mexican style uh, uh, architecture. And, and I was housed in one of the, in the Center for European Studies in one of the largest rooms they had there uh, um, because uh, they were not allowed to house uh, somebody in that room. Uh, the, the thing was that I was there seven weeks, I think, after the earthquake when the, the Bay Bridge uh, uh, collapsed. He might, I guess as most, for most of you before you were uh, born, but it was quite a, a disaster. And, and although the Stanford University is very solidly built, uh, uh, there was a crack in the sort of this, the stone bar above the door. And the university was not allowed to house a employee of their own in that room um, because they were uh, financially liable. But for a guest like me, they were not. So I could uh, sit in that room. And indeed, the only escape was through that door. There was no window, so if it would have cracked, I would not have stood here, probably. Um, and at the beginning, you feel a bit nervous, but then after a while, you see, oh, there's nothing, nothing happening, no more earthquake. 
uh, and in the end, I had a, actually quite a nice uh, room there. And, um, a fantastic place uh, to be. There are a few university college students also that have made it to, uh, to Stanford. Uh, as you know. Down at the bottom is another beautiful university. Uh, also a place I would highly recommend for, for graduate studies. Um, that is the University of Constance, where I worked for five years. And as you can see, it is uh, in the greens. It is a bit outside so the downtown area and uh, right on the lake of uh, Constance. Down here is the University of Vienna, at least the Economics University of Vienna. And if you this, you might know that it's uh, the oldest university in Holland, like the university. Um, so yeah, that was continued my discoveries. Uh, these are some of my teachers, uh, of which I learned a lot. Um, um, the, the one in the middle is interesting. Does anybody know who this is? Uh, I guess you can't read this. Strange face, nobody. That was the president of CERN, at least, uh, Finnish Jan. Uh, and there he still has, you know, the, the dress that he wears as a, a ceremonial dress as a as president. He, uh, that, the, that's also the weapon of uh, 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 Sarna down there. And he was my high school teacher. Uh, and he was my mathematics teacher. And I had him for five five years. Uh, a pretty strict uh, a teacher, uh, uh, you know, which meant that I learned a lot in mathematics, but I forgot most of it again, so you don't keep practicing. Um, and uh, I must say, I had high respect for him because he was one of the few, many, many astronomies that uh, went to study in Holland. Uh, and I uh, studied then here, got a degree here, and then uh, many of them left, as uh, stayed in Holland. Uh, though they got a scholarship actually from Sarnam, uh, they preferred to stay in Holland. And that was a time when, you know, they, they, there was the same nationality. Uh, you could just uh, stay with the Dutch passport. Um, so he was one of the idealists who went back, and in my days, my father considered him a communist, that is, uh, so he didn't like it very much that I got mathematics from him, but luckily he didn't teach me social science, uh, at least luckily for my father. Uh, um, the others are uh, uh, also uh, highly respected, the professors, Lammers and Scott uh, in Leiden, uh, they were my PhD supervisors, uh, so the was uh, a, a leading uh, social scientist, political scientist, by now retired at the European University Institute, but after his retirement, he's still there, so if anybody of you ever makes it there. Uh, he's a very inspiring person, very social and American, uh, uh, originally from Stanford, um, and made it to Florence. And then in the middle is Professor Lane Rook, who's a German uh, uh, political scientist. Uh, he long time president of the uh, both the German as well as the International Political Science Association. And, uh, uh, originally actually trained as a theologian, I was, uh, but then he turned to theory uh, and uh, became a, a political scientist. Um, all people actually that somehow, the case five by the way, is uh, now, uh, although he's already for 10 years retired, uh, he is uh, still a member of the Dutch Council of State, the Raad van Staten, who is the official advisory council. Uh, to, the, uh, to the government, uh, and, and he hasn't changed much. He still looks as young as he, uh, he did uh, then. Um, for me, they're all authorities. Uh, um, so coming back to the question at the beginning, sort of why, that's why, authority says it. Uh, I had quite some difficulty actually uh, sort of getting rid of their, their sense of authority when they uh, sort of uh, um, said, well, this is, this is the answer or that is the answer, although most of them actually are not so, uh, so strict. Uh, and of course, from them I also learned uh, the question. Um, um, but um, I still have difficulty actually uh, disagreeing uh, uh, with them. OK. Um, yeah, then a curious phenomenon. When you do discoveries also, it's come up also to uh, what you could call sort of inconvenient truth. And a interesting case is uh, um, uh, that I sort of realized at some point in time, I owe my life to the Nazis. Uh, sounds very strange, uh, but the story is that my mother, uh, uh, her brother and her fiance were in the resistance during the war. And uh, 
um, they were founders of the, the journal Trau, uh, uh, which was a set up in the uh, resistance, uh, and both got uh, uh, killed by the, uh, um, the Germans uh, in, uh, by the end of the war, beginning of 45, end of 44. Uh, and yeah, that, you know, I, I was so used to that, and this thing was very, uh, heroes in the family would be proud of him. But then at some point I started wondering, hey, what would have happened if uh, the, the Germans had not done that? Then my mother would have married somebody else, uh, or as she was already uh, verloved, how do you call that, fiance? Uh, Engaged. Uh, with this person, huh? Engaged. Engaged, yeah, right. Uh, uh, um, and uh, yeah, then, then I would either have not been there, or I would have been somebody else completely, uh, with a completely different father. He was actually very strict uh, 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 Protestant. Uh, so yeah, it's not politically correct to think that, and also for me not personally, of course, uh, but, but it is a, a truth. I mean, if the Germans had not done that, I wouldn't be here. Uh, uh, and yeah, that's, uh, I feel uneasy about it, but it's what I would call you discover that after a while you realize that, hey, it's sort of a light. Uh, um, that, uh, and it still hinders me sometimes. Uh, okay, so my last message, so once and again, is I would say to all of you, be curious, imagine, and I would say reach for the skies. I often hear from students, not here at University College, but when I used to teach in economics, uh, 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 ask them, what are you going to do? And students would say, well, I look for a good job or so, but uh, not much, sort of really ambitious. I want to become, I don't know, prime minister of this, I want to become the president of Phillips, or uh, I want to do good to the world, or whatever. Uh, uh, I would say, reach for the skies. Uh, um, but of course, I would also very much urge you to question authority. Keep asking questions. Uh, that is my message. Keep asking questions, which means you might also question this advice. Uh, and, and of course, here I come at rent. Okay, so much for it. Uh, carry the skies without you. <laughs> okay, that was it.